Hello everyone, my name is Louise Stokes and I'm from Digital Leaders and it's my great pleasure to be chairing today's webinar. Uh, it's a special webinar today for, uh, it is the first uh, Digital Leaders Week uh, this week and this is the webinar what we're doing. So we'll crack on giving uh, enough people time to join. So the topic today is helping young people face complex challenges using technology. Um, and a bit of background on the topic before I hand over to our presenters. Uh, New Philanthropy Capital, or otherwise known as NPC, is working with young people in the UK and Kenya uh, to identify opportunities for digital technology to deliver social impact, work collaboratively with charities in the tech sector, and to raise funds to invest in the most promising tech solutions. They will co-create experience maps of young people's journeys through the social sector's products and services and build on these to prioritise opportunities for technology to create the greatest impact. So Tris and Andrew today will be taking us through um, their journey and what they're doing. Um, but first of all, I'll introduce myself. So I'm Louise Stokes. Um, you can tweet along using the hash at hashtag DigiLeaders and follow us at, at DigiLeaders and I look after everything online for the program, including all our social media and email comms and websites. So um, it is wonderful to be with you today and thank you all for joining on. Um, some webinar guidelines before I introduce our presenters. Do please mute your microphones um, during the presentation and contact my, myself or the Digital Leaders account through the chat box in GoToMeeting if you have any questions throughout the presentation. I'll be collecting all these as we go. And then uh, in the second half of the session today, um, we will be going through the Q&A part of uh, the webinar. So um, do let me know when you send through your question if you have microphone access, as it will be wonderful for me to be able to um, allow you to ask your question out loud straight to Tris and Andrew. Um, if not, of course, I can, ha I can happily ask the question on your behalf. So our presenters today, we have Tris Lumley, who's the Director of Innovation and Development um, and also Compliance Director for NPC. Tris leads NPC's work on innovation, researching and developing innovative approaches, mm -hmm. new models and new ventures to create significant long-term contributions to the capability and capacity of the social sector. He also leads on developing NPC's relationships with core funders, which are philanthropists, foundations and businesses who have a shared commitment to transforming the social sector to achieve its full potential. And then we also have Andrew Weston, who is a policy and development officer at MPC. And he works um, in their think, think tank and external affairs team, combine, combining MPC's organisational knowledge with the conversations going on in the sector to drive our think tank work. During his time at MPC, he has worked on a wide range of projects. These include producing measurement recommendations for a major healthcare charity, identifying potential um, grantees for a philanthropist interest, interested um, in supporting people's accessing the arts. So, Tris and Andrew, I will now unmute you and hand you over the controls and we'll kick off your presentation. Great, thanks Louise uh, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I'll say a little bit about uh, NPC and about the work we're trying to do, but before I get into kind of talking, I'm really keen uh, to hear your to hear your reflections. The work that we're doing is fairly new. Um, we're trying to take an approach which is which builds on a lot of the learning of the technology sector actually about the importance of user centered design, um, but deploying an approach within the social sector that we think is quite novel. And so we're really keen on people's input. And I know everyone says that, but I'm genuinely saying it. So uh, really hope you do have lots of questions. Um, and insight that you might want to share from your own work. And I'm also keen to connect with people beyond the webinar um, if, there's, if there's stuff that, that you'd like to talk about more. So, um, for anyone who doesn't know NPC, and I'm just checking, I have uh, some control, here we go. Yeah, so NPC is a, a think tank and consultancy. We're a charity ourselves, and we work with charities and social enterprises, funders and social investors, and the public sector uh, around um, around the delivery of services and products that aim to produce social outcomes. Um, we 
we work uh, on a consultancy basis, often on strategy, um, measurement and evaluation work. We're, we're known for our focus on impact measurement. Uh, and with funders, similarly work around strategy, around program design uh, and evaluation as well. But what we're most uh, passionate about is actually bringing together the various different elements of the social sector uh, around common issues, common opportunities, common challenges, as we believe that in order to, to reach the social sector's full potential, collaboration is absolutely vital. Again, that's something that absolutely everyone says. It's not something that necessarily happens consistently, uh, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, charities actually exist in a pretty competitive funding landscape. Uh, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about that um, with anyone from a sort of charity sector background. But it's often very difficult for organizations to meaningfully collaborate because the way that they're funded and resourced often doesn't incentivize that and, and often um, can kind of militate against it. So our work as much as possible on innovation uh, and certainly our work on technology and data, we believe that we need to be focused, laser focused on, on enabling collaboration, enabling work across the sector or across thematic areas within the sector rather than just working organization by organization. So first of all, a few kind of um, slides on some background uh, and much of this, uh, I imagine that um, many of you, this is you know te teaching grandmas to suck eggs, so I apologize for that, but just to kind of set context for where we see uh, the real potential of digital technology within the social sector. Um, I'll, we'll just run through some of these materials. Many of these are also found in uh, a report that we put out, I guess 18 months ago or so, called Tech for Common Good which is available on our website as are all our publications. Um, and while you guys certainly won't need telling why digital technology is important uh, and even transformative to organizations and their work, actually we think that there is still a case for making that argument within the social sector uh, as charities, while there are lots of um, interesting areas of work and interesting pockets of work, um, we think there's still a case to be made about where digital technology can be deployed for the greatest impact. So I won't, I won't labor over this, but obviously for individuals, so um, charities, beneficiaries, service users, and their primary constituents, technology can give them um, many of the, the benefits that are shown here, whether that's about convenience and choice, whether it's about access to information and services, um, or whether it's actually putting them in more control. We certainly see a growing movement towards empowerment um, and user-centered approaches within, within the social sector, and digital technology often provides an ideal mechanism um, for transforming that relationship between an individual and an organization from one of kind of service recipient, passive service recipient, to a much more active relationship in which individuals can both feedback on existing services, but also can uh, co-design products and services can um, produce data that flag gaps and challenges and opportunities. Uh, and in all of the sectors in which technology has already sort of driven a transformation, we see those transformations in the relationships between individuals and organizations. And probably worth saying as well that there are, you know, the kind of networks that uh, are now um, commonplace between individuals can sometimes completely go around organizations. So. I think some charities are worrying uh, whether they will be needed in the same way in 10 or 20 years when actually these days individuals can come together rapidly into communities of interest, can um, organize, mobilize, uh, and do work themselves, often without much organizational intermediation. At the organization level, a lot of the work that we already see around digital technology uh, is focused on communication. So Charities have been um, relatively good at adopting social media and seeing the opportunities there to engage with people in new ways. Uh, and also in the fundraising world, there's been a, a pretty strong uptake, although that's still continuing, of online fundraising in its many forms from kind of crowdfunding through to event-based funding uh, through to simply donation processes that are online. So that's where there has been a lot of work already. 
and there's still more to do, but that's where a lot of the digital kind of transformation has, has bitten most quickly. And that's unsurprising because it's fundraising and communications where the business model really is for charities. Where NPC thinks the real opportunity is, uh, however, is in how organizations deliver their services, their products and services. So if we're talking about um, an education organization, for example, that might be about the delivery of uh, educational materials and curricula online. Obviously, EdTech is a huge field of its own. Um, if we're talking about uh, health advice and information, then obviously that's about the provision of that information online. A lot of that is already happening. But when we start thinking about services uh, that are relationship-based, that involve an ongoing relationship between a, a kind of a, a worker and an individual, um, then people might think, well, that's you know, the, there's not so much of a role for technology there. Uh, we think they're entirely wrong. We think there's a huge role for technology to augment the best of what charities and social enterprises do. So um, that's often around developing strong human relationships, uh, but technology can do an awful lot to, to support those relationships, to allow those relationships to um, also happen online, as well as um, complementing what happens offline, to link into peer support, to um, and also to use data and analysis to kind of build on those human relationships uh, and take those services and products on to elsewhere. And many other benefits as well. Um, possibly the one that I shouldn't skip over is, is scale. So there's much talk in the social sector about organizations scaling. In reality, few organizations uh, scale in any um, really serious way compared to the size of the addressable need or challenge. Uh, and you could argue that technology is the only game in town when it comes to actually scaling an organization's products and services to reach all of the addressable need. So, so far, so straightforward. Uh, then we get to what MPC thinks is the really, really interesting piece, which is technology at the sector level, beyond individual organizations. And again, we've seen many of these transformations in other industry sectors, whether we're talking about the kind of platform technology um, that we see in eBay and Amazon with many small retailers or suppliers connecting with many thousands or millions of customers through someone else's technology platform, um, or whether that's about uh, sharing and creating common resources from open source technology to, uh, to shared data sets, uh, the power of technology really to, to intermediate between organizations and to connect those organizations is where we think the really exciting action is. And that's gonna be the focus of what I wanna talk about today. Uh, I'll skip over um, this slide, which is really just to, to highlight a few of the interesting organizations operating in this space. Um, and there are many and they're growing. Um, and there's a, a strong role for um, corporate organizations and tech companies, as well as um, charity think tanks, uh, delivery organizations, um, and a role for government too many more than should be on that slide. But why do we need a collective approach? Uh, this may already be um, very clear to you, but charities are, um, it may be no surprise to you to, to hear, um, they, fare, they face uh, resource scarcity wherever they turn. Our business model as a charity is generally pretty terrible. The business model is not to have enough money to invest in all of the stuff that could be most useful to you in delivering on your mission. So where organizations are developing technology responses, uh, they are often doing that in isolation and fragmentation. So for example, um, within the youth sector, we might find that multiple organizations are working at the, at the same time on developing an online community uh, as kind of uh, supporting existing service users and also alumni. Um, it's possible, you might argue, for them to use the same platform in common, and even that the same platform might be a useful thing across organizations. Uh, or advice work, where there is um, a huge amount of online advice and information, but that exists generally in different pockets, which may not be a problem if people are going to search out all of the right information at the right time, but is also missing the opportunity to, collect, to connect one piece of advice to the next 
which is much more um, the reality of how people's lives work. So simply, when we're investing in technology, organization by organization, that looks nothing like if you can get multiple organizations making that investment together, able to benefit their beneficiaries, but also then potentially to benefit other organizations and their beneficiaries through that technology then existing and being shared. Um, and that technology potentially creating value for individuals um, and going around organizations. That's one side of things. The second side of things is that we don't believe that any single organization solves any problem on its own. And for anyone in the, in the private sector, um, you would be familiar with talking about supply chains and value chains. These are not things that we tend to talk about an awful lot in the, in the charity sector because that's not how we're funded. We're often funded organization by organization and there are very few horizontal relationships between organizations that are more like supplier customer. So we believe that we need to focus actually on pathways on how value is created through a series of products, services and interventions that respond to the right challenge at the right time. And that therefore means looking at multiple organizations. And this little uh, value chain here shows a, a pretty simple imagined um, chain of, uh, of events and interventions where someone actually uh, arrives at a GP surgery um, seeking support. Uh, they need the support of a food bank, but also if that's connected to advice provision, um, which will connect them to the fact that at the local authority there may be uh, a solution in some way to the rent arrears that they're experiencing and that if that's then connected onto an employment charity that helps to address the, the root cause of someone's problem, then we see value being really created. If any of those interventions exist in isolation, we then rely on the individual to make the connections between those different things or for the staff within those uh, institutions to make those connections. Uh, and that doesn't always happen. So our point here is that we need to focus on pathways if we're really to understand the way that impact is created. And therefore, we think we should focus on pathways when we think about how technology is developed to respond to uh, social issues and opportunities. And then finally, that if organizations work together, they can start to address and solve types of problems that individual organizations simply can't. Uh, and we'll We'll come back to that thought um, in, in how we think about how the relationships between individuals as uh, service consumers might change with organizations. Because if you have multiple organizations working on a technology solution together, it's possible to envisage the individual having a relationship with that ecosystem of products and services, um, much as we do through any of the big technology platforms these days in a way that you simply couldn't do with each of the individual organizations. A brief case study, do um, go and have a look at the work of these guys, really, really interesting initiative um, called Send Direct, uh, and that's about the provision of products and services to um, young people and their families uh, affected by, um, by SEND, special educational needs and disabilities. And essentially, it's a, a platform through which individual families can find available products and services uh, and also can, um, can, uh, can share data about their service needs, their very specific service needs, that then the market can respond to. It's an initiative that involves multiple charities uh, and some funding to, to catalyze it. From, uh, from government, from the Department for Education, uh, and it's led by Contact a Family, um, but creates a really interesting marketplace to, uh, to create and allow relationships between multiple individuals, families and service users, multiple providers, and over time for data about service needs to then influence the development of new services and the market and really for services to be available in a way that's much more personalized um, than they have historically been. So do take a look at those, those guys online and the work they're doing. Very interesting indeed. The, the model there um, 
pretty straightforwardly was that that kind of shared investment in the technology platform benefits the, all of the charities that were involved as founders, but also very small charities who were not involved in the original development but can now use the platform uh, as a service provider. Benefit to local authorities who can use it as a marketplace for, for people within um, their local authority area. Uh, and benefits directly to, to children and families who can both connect with services um, and also potentially with each other through the platform. So platforms certainly play a huge role in other industry sectors. We would like to see more of them in our world. I'll, I'll um, skip through actually the, um, the slides on the Justice Data Lab, but for anyone who's a, um, a bit of a data geek like me, this was an initiative um, working with NPC and the Ministry of Justice to really tackle the impact challenge, which is how the hell do organizations understand the impact of the work that they've done to try to re reduce reoffending. There are many different factors that, um, that lead to, to impact. It takes time uh, and there are lots of different aspects to how you can try and measure that from an organization's perspective. But what we said was, well, hold on, government has all the data that's needed. Uh, what the charities need is access to that data. So what we suggested was some sort of a brokering organization, which is what the Justice Data Lab has become. It's a team of analysts that sits in the Ministry of Justice. It takes data from organizations of the people that they've worked with. It matches them to uh, administrative data in the police national computer, and it finds out what actually happened to them. It then provides that data back to the provider organization in an aggregated form, so there's no sharing of personal data that, um, uh, that would create privacy concerns. Uh, and the Justice Data Lab also creates a comparison group and so shows the organization what would have happened in all likelihood anyway. So I mentioned this as an example because it's, it's a, a, a service that can be utilized by any charity or indeed private sector or public sector provider of, um, of interventions within the, the criminal justice space. It's building on assets that are already there in the form of administrative data within government, and it's allowing organizations to understand their impact in much more detail for free. So, and I'll skip over there, the details of, of the, the risk factors and indeed the results, although it's, it's pretty interesting to see that what we find is that there are organizations that look like they're statistically significantly increasing reoffending rates as well as happily many more that are reducing reoffending. So together these examples we think are examples of bringing services together and integrating them, creating common resources that many organizations can use, sharing the resources that already exist and connecting them to where they're needed, um, aggregating information for greater insight, and ultimately also delivering models at scale. And so our principles building on this kind of theoretical work are pretty straightforward. They're to start with beneficiaries' needs. They're to look at what already exists and not to necessarily build something new. They're to understand the business case for this, so where value is created and for whom, uh, in order to understand how to resource and sustain it. To work collaboratively with the right people involved. Uh, and above all, really, in the technology sector, that it's not really about the technology, it's about addressing needs, uh, and we mustn't get um, diverted by the shininess of new technology. A lot of what needs to be done in the charity sector is not about the, the most bleeding edge technology, it's about stuff that the private sector has been doing often for many years. So we build on this theoretical work and we say, okay, what next? We want to actually work with groups of organizations in different sectors to try and take all of these principles and put them into action. And I'll skip through the, the kind of the model for, for how we're planning to do that. And Andrew can talk about um, what we're actually doing in the youth sector in the UK and touch on our work um, with uh, young women around employment opportunities in Kenya um, and in future in India. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, often, when the sex talks about digital, it's just this big, wonderful, attractive, promised land, um, but the difficulty can be figuring out exactly how to get there. Um, so one of the things that we've been trying to do with this project is 
actually try out developing some of the ways of thinking and identifying some of the different needs that people might have in a digital space. And a lot of this is a matter of borrowing what's already been done very well in the private sector and trying to avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, so what we did is we got together a group of uh, large youth charities, predominantly ones who are quite keen on sort of the digital space, um, and talked to them about which groups they really felt needed the additional help. And the group they really pointed out were young people with very high levels of need, multiple and complex needs, or young people who have been um, not in education or training for a long period of time. Um, at that point, to be honest, we are trying very hard to not be too much led by those charities. Instead, we're trying to take a youth-led approach. We're trying to work with the young people as much as possible to try and shape the project, which has been a very, which is a very interesting experience. I think very different to what the norm has been um, for the sector in a lot of cases. The way we're going to try and do that, and we've just started to discuss the recruitment process now, um, is getting the young people together into small workshops um, and then using that to map um, different user journeys that they take through, the youth, through youth services, different crunch points, different points where difficulties arise. Um, when we can identify those points, we're then going to consult with a wide range of digital experts and try and figure out the best technology solutions at these different points. And we hope that this can create um, effectively a map of ideal points for funding, which could in the future be used to help to leverage um, a digital fund. And just to, just to make uh, a little reference to, um, for anyone who's not as familiar with uh, the charity sector and how it's funded, you know, why is this different from anything that any individual organization would be doing? Well, often those individual organizations are looking at how digital technology can be brought into their existing products and services, they're not actually going out there and saying um, what's young people's experience in general and where can technology play the greatest in uh, the, the greatest role. So we're in a way trying to get around the organisations and straight to, to, the, to the users. And particularly related to that, it's also about getting meaningful feedback from young people and from the young people who are having the sort of experiences that we want to shape these services for. Um, there have been times when the sector has tried to get some information from young people, but it's come out as very tokenistic, or alternatively, where um, there's been the danger of um, only getting the people who sort of shout the loudest, are already very engaged, and therefore don't represent the boots you're trying to reach out to, especially with something like this, where we're trying to target people who are quite likely to be relatively disengaged from the system. And so we're not, I uh, should say, we're also not trying to be critical of individual organizations. We're not saying that they're just bad at listening, bad at getting user input, often uh, quite the opposite of that. But they are individual organizations and they have those incentives around them to fund and resource their work uh, and to develop, certainly if they're gonna develop technology, do that in a way that that backs up their strategies and their plans, and so there often aren't um, there aren't vehicles to resource more collective, collaborative work. Um, so I am very, very briefly going to touch on exactly how we're going on some um, rough views of how we're going to do this. Um, we've decided because it's quite resource and time intensive to collect meaningful information, and we want to prioritise collecting that meaningful information to have a relatively small geographic scope. Um, so we're going to be looking at young people services in the London borough of Camden. Um, and we hope this will make sure we have the most accurate map of their experiences and let us sort of test the model um, to its, its best capacity. Um, we're going to have a um, small panel of young people who are maybe further along in their journey, more able to engage day to day, who will help us to shape the project itself. And then that will be combined with some um, smaller workshops with young people at lots of different points um, using the main indicator of who are either neat or in danger of becoming neat, um, age 16 to 25. Um, and to be honest, considering I think I may quickly move on to um, the other youth, sorry, the other digital project we've been looking at is the Women's Tech Fund. 
Um, this is coming from a very different direction. Um, with the youth work, we've been able to start um, very much bottom up. We've started by trying to engage with young people from the very, very beginning. Um, the Women's Tech Fund is working to look at empowering women in the developing world. Um, um, and the first step of that has been trying to figure out which parts of the developing world might be most effective to engage with them. Um, so this has involved us having to take a much more, um, a, a higher level initial approach to try and um, filter down and figure out the best places to work. And the main interesting thing that's come out of this, which I will bring up a horribly hideous screenshot of, and I apologize for the resolution, um, is some of the challenges that can come around trying to use um, um, trying to use publicly available data. We often have this image that you have a big pile of data, it's already out there, it's very easy to access and use, um, and then that can give us this information. And this shows some of the realistic bugbears that can happen. Um, we were predominantly drawing this from World Bank data, um, but uh, we found that some areas are quite patchy. You can see the collection of non-applicables there. Um, um, and also you run into some real problems around sort of validity of things like um, statistics from governments that may not always be entirely honest about these sorts of things. Um, but what it has been really helpful with is it's allowed us to start a process of, um, it allows us to start a process of prioritizing some of the different regions um, and filtering out some of the different possibilities so we can then start to do a little bit more traditional investigative work to figure out where we can make the most impact. So that's been a process that's led us to focusing on Kenya and then we hope India within the initial research. But actually the research approach itself is is really pretty much the same between our work in Camden and our work in, in Kenya and India. And that's really to work, as Andrew said, in this in-depth workshopping approach to really map out people's lived experience. Um, so whereas user journeys might often be in the commercial world around specific products or services, we want to see those pathways of general experience over, over recent years that would illustrate how someone might move from school to maybe dropping out of school because of particular issues they were facing. They might receive some support in the form of uh, youth work or a youth centre that's trying to re-engage them in education to some extent. There might be confidence building work and maybe a sports project linked to a mentoring program, linked to skills building and eventually into employment opportunities and so on. So you can see that that's really about pathways and user journeys. And that's the central unit of analysis for us. We want to see and map out those user journeys and to use those as the basis of then identifying the priorities for technology against them and to raise collaborative pooled funds to invest in those priorities. So much as a, a, a normal regular foundation, a grant making foundation or investor might be seeking applications from individual organizations and then making some decisions, we really wanna turn that on its head and say if you build on the user-centered approach and perspective, if those people working with technologists and designers um, can then set the priorities, then we have a much better chance, we think, we believe, and the logic says, of investing in the most uh, important areas. And actually one of the questions that came out already was, what makes you think your approach will be more effective than existing approaches? Well, the proof is in the pudding. We will obviously be evaluating whether or not we are leading to a more effective uh, approach. But for us, that starts with, have we listened to the right people about what is most important to them? And often, despite this being the charity sector, uh, and despite the fact that beneficiaries are um, both in theory and in our legal documents at the center of what we do, it turns out that strategies uh, and program development and technology development often doesn't start from that intensely user-centered approach. And partially that's because that's not how the money that is invested in those organizations um, is, is kind of shaped uh, and what, what is sought by those funders and investors. I'm very happy to take questions on, on those. But on the bottom kind of level of, of this chart, what are we actually going to be investing in? 
Well, we think there are three different types of uh, kind of technology opportunities that we'll find. Um, and those are, we'll find gaps. We'll find areas in which uh, the participants in the research have said, this is a really important area for us. So maybe that's about um, uh, peer communities around mentoring programs, for example. Just an example off the top of my head. But then it may be that actually there aren't good technology products out there to address that opportunity. And what we'll need to do is run an innovation process. However, we think there's already a lot out there that, that can be invested in. And we think we will find um, technology products and solutions developed by what's often called the tech for good space. So often social enterprises who are focused on a social mission, on a social purpose in their development of technology, uh, and that we can, we can invest in those, um, those organizations and products through grant funding to help them scale. But critically, that it's not just about the financial investment, we'll be working collaboratively with the youth sector in, in the UK case, so that we're actually hoping to get those technology solutions channels to market. Because often what we find is that there are brilliant, brilliant initiatives, none of them are scaling. Um, and then in the third category of what we think we'll invest in is actually the private sector. So the commercial technology sector is where clearly most of the investment is going into in, in terms of new technologies, um, the, the sort of the, the social sector and its investment in technology pales into insignificance. And indeed, the business model kind of works in the, in the private sector for investing in and developing and maintaining technology in an ongoing sense in a way that it often doesn't in the grant and donation funded charity sector. So where we find an opportunity or priority for technology, where um, a commercial organization already has a product set that might fit very well, we want to be able to go to those companies and say, here's an opportunity uh, for here's an opportunity for you to potentially develop into a new market, potentially requiring a different business model and different thinking around pricing. And there's a spectrum there all the way from kind of CSR initiatives where you're giving away uh, product um, for for free to uh, blended pricing models where there are there's um, there are cheaper products for, or free products for small organizations um, through to actually products that the market can be developed over time and will become uh, a commercially attractive and sustainable market. But at the point of development, it may require um, subsidy or impact investment to some to some extent to to get there. Um, so I'm, I'm going to finish at that point on on what we wanted to say. Uh, I know there are some questions there so we will get to those questions um and i think while while people may or may not have mics we certainly have the chat to um to see the questions that are coming through so we can start um start to do those excellent thanks tris and thanks andrew um there's a little bit of a feedback guys if you just want to mute yourselves uh, while i ask a question there we go. I've just muted you now. So um, there's been a few questions through. Thanks, everyone. And do send them through, guys, if, as, as you think of them, and we'll get through them now in this segment. So you can either send them through to myself, Louise Stokes, or to the Digital Leaders account, and we'll call upon you. Um, so we've got one from Jonathan from UK Youth, um, and he's asked, um, how do you participate in the digital analysis? Uh, going back to a previous slide. I'll just unmute you now, guys. If, so, uh, hi, Jonathan. UK Youth is one of the, um, the leading four organisations involved as partners in the project. So good to have um, someone from UK Youth on the line. If the question was about how people can participate in the project, um, then I, I'd be happy to talk about that off, offline. And we're working with Matt Lent at UK Youth on the kind of the development of the project. Um, I'm not sure if the if by digital analysis you meant something else there, um, but certainly the two phases of the project are the, the research phase where we're working directly with young people, uh, and then the phase that follows on from that, which is working with as many um, technologists, tech companies, designers, youth organizations, and the young people themselves uh, as want to be involved 
in turning the sort of the priorities that come out of those pathways and, um, and experience maps into priorities for technology. So there's certainly scope for, um, for you or others to be involved if, if they're interested. Great, he's saying there in the chat, drop me an email and we can pick up offline. Excellent. There's a question Great. from James um, saying, which I think you can see in there, Tris, young people with complex needs are, are also at the least likely to be digitally included. What do you think the answer is? Well, if I may on that one, I think it's, very, it's a very, very interesting question and it's one of the reasons why we think it's so important to do this um, user-led approach. I think there can sometimes be a response of trying to, when, when people hear about digital and they hear about digital interventions, trying to go for the most complex, advanced, cutting edge thing possible. And what we want to do is talk with the young people we're trying to work with and figure out what, if any, digital tools they already use. It may turn out that part of the answer is they're not very integrated with these things and engaged with these things, and therefore it's more about ways they'd like the people that they work with to be more connected. Um, once we've got a good feel for their different, the different services they interact with, what they're already using, how they're already communicating, um, an interesting example I saw from another piece of work we're doing is um, young people may have, um, some young people have a really, really good understanding of social media, things like Instagram and Facebook, but may not actually be very good at dealing with things like emails just because it's not piece of technology I use much in day-to-day -day life. Um, once we have a feel for what those relationships are, what those skills are, and where that matters, we can then potentially look at um, interventions that could make sense to help to learn and um, introduce them to new concepts and empower them to be more sort of digitally engaged and included. But the thing that I, I, I almost feel I need to have tattooed on my arm during this project is so much it will come down to what the young people say and what directions they point us in. And just to respond to the, um, you know, you made both a good point about um, access to, to both skills uh, and the technology itself um, and, and access to the internet, then yes, there, there is one level at which if people don't have any access to technology at all, um, then obviously developing a digital response can further exclude them. Um, that picture is, is rapidly shifting um, and whether that's in the UK or internationally, the, um, you know, the, the penetration of mobile technology, even if that's not smartphone technology, um, you know, just zooms uh, through the roof every day. Uh, and so I think that to some extent, uh, it's also about understanding the right technology, as Andrew was saying, and the right kind of product. And it may be that actually text is, is the, a key um, communication mechanism for, for most charities if they're to um, remain in, in more constant contact with people. Um, rather than kind of smartphone driven apps. Uh, but yes, we think there's still, you know, you have to, you have to tackle the, in the inclusion challenge. Uh, and we think there's a huge role for um, both the telecoms companies and ISPs uh, and hardware providers and lots of really interesting programs going on, many of those outside of the UK about um, giving people technology and access to technology as part of a program as well as then the skills uh, skills to, to use it. And I think the, just because, um, because actually people who are, tend to be most excluded may have the most, may also have the most complex needs, that's a real reason for us to, to focus in this area and to work as hard as possible um, to try to do something about that, because that's where the greatest benefits and the greatest results are are to be realised. And I think the work of an organisation, a youth organisation like Dragon Hall, for example, a youth centre in Camden, um, would show you that uh, would show you that you can both um, recruit and access young people with complex needs uh, and disabilities and experiencing multiple disadvantage, and you can also help them to develop digital skills and we're not just talking about office and PowerPoint and boring stuff we're talking about the stuff that's inspiring and exciting whether that's 3d printing or augmented reality so we see it as kind of yin and yang to this project this project is looking about how technology can deliver real value to, to young people and um, improve social outcomes 
but we will not overlook the, the inclusion part of that um, to avoid excluding people further. Wonderful, thanks so much guys. Um, we have a question from Catherine Tranfield, who um, I will mention by the way, she is a finalist this year for the Young Digital Leader of the Year. It's a new category we're doing. Um, and she does have a microphone, I believe. So we'll just I'll just unmute you now, Kat, if you are able to ask your question out loud. If not, um, I'm happy to ask the question on your behalf. It might oh, there's there. Um, can you hear me? Um, is it? Is it working? Because um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, applying yeah, business can, models. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah, we can. Hi, Kat, it's working, sorry. Hi, Kat, it's working, sorry. Okay, okay thanks. Um, could you possibly apply the business model to other aspects of the public sector, for example, the NHS and health charities, an example like increasing individual access to GPs and access to medical knowledge for everyone with a smartphone, really, everyone who's connected, and particularly for elderly people as well? Yes. Um, very briefly, yes. Uh, but more, um, this is a model that we'd hope could be applied across many different sectors. Um, um, we, have, we did some very initial thinking about this for older people as it happens, uh, which you might want to touch on a bit more. Yeah, I mean, the, what we're trying to do at this point is to prove the concept in terms of the research approach and in terms of generating insight that can then be um, can be operationalized, horrible word, um, by you know backing um, the the priorities that come out with with funding and investment, but yes, absolutely, we we would like to see this kind of an approach where the voice of the field, the voice of the people who are most important, who are supposed to benefit, um, is directly informing and helping to prioritise the development of technology in all areas. And actually, you know, you men mentioned healthcare and and health charities, so they do think about pathways. You know, that that's one of the areas of the sector where. And people think about pathways both clinical and kind of non-clinical and so there there's often a good understanding that you need 17 different interventions and products to to um, be provided at the right points in a in someone's pathway to to deliver a good result um, but yeah uh, the the hope would be that um, you know a few years from now we've both we've been working in a number of different sectors to take this kind of approach and a number of different geographies so beyond Camden as someone else asked the question but also others are too you know we don't we don't want to just this isn't the idea isn't that this is just an NPC research um, engine that we just churn out pieces of research out of the sausage machine we um, we are passionate that um, that we want to see the voice and perspective uh, and co-design of the people who are supposed to benefit from social purpose organizations and public services shaping uh, how those are developed and shaping how technology is developed in response to their challenges and opportunities so we'd like to see this happening in many more places all around the world and if i could just also add to that um not just many more places but all of those places being a bit more connected um, I mean, just one of the realities of piloting an approach is we've had to very much focus on the youth sector, but we appreciate that in reality people don't just exist in comfortable little sector silos. Um, so particularly when it comes to health, one of the things that's so fascinating is how much things like, well, good housing can affect health, um, or for that matter, um, people accessing youth services may have mental health needs. Um, so if I was thinking in the very long term, sort of the, the ultimate ambition for these sorts of things, um, you'd not just see this tool used, this method used in lots and lots of different sectors, but you'd see a way to link those sectors and create a truly accurate user journey for all the different paths that people can take. And just to, uh, um, Andrew's talking about ambition, just to, to come clean about our ultimate ambition of what we'd really like to see coming out of all of this work, is really the way that we now expect to interact with commercial products and services all the time as individuals in a market of one where we have access to a personalized ecosystem of products and services around us and sure that's shaped by um, uh, data being fed to advertisers to focus things on us but it's also we have a lot of control over what we access 
Um, and we can envisage in the youth sector, for example, um, an app being developed at some point in time, uh, a digital assistant app that is helping young people to navigate this world of products and services and commercial products and services that can help them at different points in time, that can nudge them, that can encourage them to get involved in stuff, um, that knows them really well because it's their app representing them and that really helps to, uh, to be a really smart intermediary between uh, young people and all the stuff that's out there. Because fundamentally, if we're going to make any sort of a dent on the social issues and challenges that we face, we have to think much, much, much smarter about how we mobilize and, and utilize the resources that are already out there than we currently are, are doing. And that's not about one-to-one -one connections between individuals and organizations. It's about the world of stuff that's out there and helping people uh, with, with the help of technology to navigate um, that ecosystem. So it sounds like you're talking a little bit there about um, potentially artificial intelligence. Can you go into a little bit more detail about what sort of technology products or services you'll think uh, you think will be kind of priority areas for you? I think yeah, we'll come back to, to AI. I think that so the the areas of technology that we think um, will be priorities, and we we you know we're talking about basic digital technology here um so we're, we're talking about fairly standard stuff but i think it's technology to deliver products or services whether that's um uh, or parts of products or services whether that's advice mentoring um whatever that might be that's actually technology to deliver a product or service there's technology to connect products and services and organizations and so essentially i think there we're often talking about apis if you're if you're a mentoring organization and there's a um, there's an employment opportunity organization or some sort of a broker and you have an API between your systems that's able to say this person has reached this point in their mentoring um, journey and is now ready for um, for an employment opportunity you start to create the sort of horizontal connections that I was saying often didn't exist earlier so whether that's referrals from one organization to the next, um, or, um, or kind of an almost contractual relationship, we're essentially talking about APIs. And then the final area is, is this sort of empowering and giving people control over that uh, ecosystem of products and services. So when you have digitally enabled um, sets of services and products, if you can then connect people to those through a platform, um, then, then you can really start to do exciting stuff. And then on AI, if we, I don't know how many years we need to, to zoom forward to imagine that all the kind of public services uh, and youth services um, that are available to young people and commercial products and services are all kind of digitally enabled and live on a platform. But if we imagine that a young person might have their own kind of personal data store, their own app that, um, that they can share a lot of data with about their about themselves and maybe it can have access to their social media data and feeds from education and uh, and health and so on then yeah for sure you can have an ai sitting in the background representing them so actually an ai that's helping you to make the best decisions that you can about what services might help you at this point in time um and and representing you because it's your personal AI sat on on your own digital assistant app. and and because we're charities um, that doesn't have to be about commercial benefit um, it can be about representing the human so maybe that's winding forward too far um, to see from now there's also a huge potential for machine learning just in understanding how people move from you know product A to, to intervention B um, and what the connections are between what is a complex web of existing products and services. And if I... Um, or is the, is the, the personal part? Um, I think one of the places where the sector needs, when it's thinking about what technologies to use in the future to be quite different from the private sector, um, is often the tools that are being used to facilitate these connections are very 
are, are hidden away, are very private, no one really understands what's happening with their data when they give it away. Um, and we want to try, and right now we're trying to make a very transparent process, a process that involves users as much as possible, and I'd like to see that continue if we reach the point where we start to look at sort of more infrastructure questions to make sure that people continue to have that personal control sort of throughout their digital journey. Yeah, and, and just to sort of move on directly um, and build on that to James, your question about how people feel about their data and your data. So again, yeah, we think that charities actually have to set out their stall on, um, on personal data um, in a way that they haven't yet. Uh, so uh, another project that we're kind of exploring at the moment is the development of a personal data charter for social purpose organizations that would say, <coughs> excuse me, that would say, we're not companies, we don't want your data to sell it um, uh, to the highest bidder or it's not driven by profit. We're not government, so we don't mandate this. We would like access to your personal data so that we can make sure that you can be connected to the most important and effective products and interventions at the right point in time so that we can learn about our impact and improve what we're doing. But because we're charities, um, we want to be ultimately totally accountable and transparent. We want you to be able to see anything that we do with uh, or say about your data. And ultimately, we think the strong interpretation of that is is to provide people with um, uh, with platforms that are, really do allow them to own their data or at least to have control over them. Uh, and so there are a number of these that I'm kind of aware of uh, at various sort of stages of development. One is CitizenMe, one is Digi.me, um, but Digi.me, for example, would allow you actually to, to hold in your own personal data store all the data that other you know, your Facebook data, your health data, if your health provider is connected, to bring it back into your own data store uh, and there to use it and control it and get value from it yourself. But really saying that charities represent the individual, maybe what we should be saying is when it comes to personal data, you should own it or as close to that model as possible. But that's a space that I expect to develop a lot over the, the coming years. GDPR is creating a lot of focus um, and worry among charities in, in how they should think about personal data. But most of that is not thinking about their beneficiaries and service users and their data. It's thinking about donor data. Um, that's where almost all of the interest seems to be at the moment. And we think, again, there's huge opportunity if we think about personal data in, in the delivery of services. Thanks so much, Tris, and thank you, Andrew. Um, we're just about out of time today, so that is the end of our question time. I will be connecting everyone who registered today with yourselves um, by email so that you can connect to our presenters directly with any further questions you might have. Um, the session was also fully recorded, so we'll be uploading the audio and the slides onto YouTube, and we'll send you over the link um, to that this afternoon and there'll also be a short survey so thank you everyone again for joining today and do check out um, hashtag DL week and hashtag digi leaders at the moment because this week there's a lot of activity with uh, digital leaders week so thanks again for joining and we hope to see you again soon bye-bye